Uh, I am delighted to be here. Th thank you very much to the uh, Zuza Institute for the invitation. I have to say that the program today has been absolutely outstanding. The talks, every one of the talks has been engaging and I have learned an awful lot today, so it's wonderful. Um, I have the world's greatest job. All the other speakers probably would say the same thing, but they were lying because I have the world's greatest job. Uh, I do research in artificial intelligence and I use games as my application, which means if you ever come into my office and I'm playing a game, it's research. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Today we're actually celebrating the computer revolution, which Conrad Zuse started 75 years ago. But I want to talk today about computer evolution because one of the impacts of the computer revolution is that it's forced us to do some fundamental changes in our thinking. We have to rethink what it means to think. Go back to the year 1900, just go back 100 years ago and imagine what people would have said if you'd pointed to a little black box and said, this thing's going to fix your spelling mistakes. People would have been astounded, and yet technology for spelling detection is just standard technology today. And so what I believe is one of the most profound contributions of the 20th century is the realization that intelligent behavior can be realized by non-human information processing architectures. And so what we really have is at least two, and as some of our speakers have said, um, potentially more than two, architectures for intelligence. So presumably you're familiar with the um, computing and data storage device here. Um, this CPU is often referred to as a brain and this computing device is, uh, produces what we would call intelligent behavior. But the second device that I want to talk about is this one. It's a printed circuit board with uh, memory chips with a CPU, and we don't think of it as intelligent. What I prefer to do is think of it as creating the illusion of intelligence because this is not really intelligent, it's not yet sentient. If you're going to build an intelligent system on a computing device, what you want to do is exploit the strengths of that device. So for dealing with a brain, a human, Humans are very good at things like language and generalization and, re and reasoning by analogy and all sorts of things. If you're going to use a computer, computers are very good at calculations, repetitious tasks, and large infallible memories. So if you're going to solve a problem, you need to know which device you're going to use and exploit what the device is good at. But what's interesting is the complementary with the weaknesses. So it's easy for a computer is often very hard for a human and vice versa. So whereas it's easy for a computer to compute a third order partial differential equation to 64 digits worth of accuracy in a few seconds, that's something you and I would probably be quite challenged to do. Or if I asked you to memorize the entire Wikipedia and recite back, it back to me, you'd probably be challenged. But it's very easy for a computer to do. So along with this computer revolution, we've had this evolution and revolution in artificial intelligence. And games have been at the forefront of it. And in the 1940s, plus or minus a few years, we had some of the most brilliant minds in information theory thinking about artificial intelligence and games and how we could use this new burgeoning technology to create intelligence. What I want to do is show you three examples. They're all board games to show the evolution. Um, I'm going to ignore some of the other big successes in games. We're now perfect at two-player poker, and I'm sure you heard about IBM's Watson and Jeopardy. But for comparison purposes, I'm just going to stick with three examples to do with board games. The first is work that I actually did in, in checkers. This goes back to 1994. Um, this is the computer. This is called the Marion Tinsley model. It was designed and fabricated in 1927. I'm not sure what kind of uh, hardware warranty it came uh, with back there in 1927. But this model was able to play an amazing game 
of checkers. Uh, he became world champion several times and was so much better than all his opponents that he got bored with the game and retired. And then after a few years, he'd come back, beat everybody and be world champion and then get bored and, and retire. So a very interesting story. Um, here's the machine, the people, the entities that need to compete with the very best human. The star of the show is uh, in the center. Uh, that is the computer, it's a silicon graphics computer uh, in 1994, uh, 16 processor machine, and of course the four people around there, including a rather young looking myself, um, were the people who uh, worked on this project. And if we look at the scorecard for this big man versus machine events which happened in 1992 and 1994, you can see that uh, my computer was only five years old, but the human computer was 65. That 65-year-old computer had been analyzing the game for 42 years. Imagine a software application churning away for 42 years analyzing the game of checkers. That's what the Tinsley computer did. My computer was only churning away for four years, so clearly Tinsley had a massive uh, information processing advantage. What's amazing, though, is over that 42-year span, Tinsley only lost three games, three competitive games. He actually lost two others, which he, doesn't, uh, which he talks about, but nobody else talks about, because when you've had too much to drink at a bar and you accidentally make a mistake and lose a game, nobody really counts that as a real loss. But Tinsley did do that once, and it's a source of, it was a source of extreme disappointment for him. Um, on the other hand, Tinsley had a, a, an incredibly powerful computer. This computer had 100 trillion synapses, connections. You know, talk about these networks that people are building uh, around the world. Uh, the human brain has a hundred trillion of these synapses. Uh, we had a, just a pathetic 16 CPUs. That was uh, several million transistors. I mean, clearly the human had an enormous computing advantage. Uh, Tinsley had an amazing memory for a human model. Uh, I know Zuz's model didn't have a lot of memory, and this Tinsley model doesn't have a, a lot of memory. It can certainly store megabytes of information, but, but not gigabytes. And his memory included all the games that he studied, which clearly was many tens of thousands of games, but he had the ability to memorize all of those games. My computer, on the other hand, would run, churn in the background and memorized uh, 40 trillion data points something that Tinsley could not compete with. Uh, one thing where they did differ is uh, in personality. Tinsley was a perfect gentleman, one of the nicest uh, computers that you would ever meet. My computer was quite rambunctious. Even though Tinsley was world champion, it showed no respect for Tinsley and would often play challenging, audacious, ridiculous moves, uh, taunting Tinsley, which I thought was rather, uh, rather rude. The verdict was in 1994, Chinook became the first computer program to win a human world championship in any game. Um, I referred to Tinsley's hardware, which was the 1927 model. Unfortunately, the warranty expired, and in 1995, his, uh, his hardware failed, and unfortunately, we have lost the Tinsley uh, computer. Uh, in 2007, I had continued my computations, and we announced that Checkers was solved. Um, what that means is the program is now perfect. Um, it will never lose. The, the, the result of the game with perfect play is a draw, which means computers will never lose to humans again. And of course, if you make a mistake, well, um, the computer can win. So I want to put some of this in perspective so that we can compare it against the other two games. You'll see the number of possibilities in checkers. It's quite large. It's 500 billion billion, five times 10 to the 20th. It's a big number that you need to master. And for the time, we're talking about 1994, we built a massive data set. Um, we solved every position with 10 or fewer pieces on the board, 40 trillion data points that was in the program's memory. And of course, that exceeded anything humans could possibly do. As I alluded to earlier, Tinsley could memorize megabytes of information, but certainly not gigabytes or terabytes, and our computer has no difficulty uh, doing that. Let's talk about chess, 1997. Here's the uh, human computer, and uh, the model uh, was named a, a Garry Kasparov model. And to be quite candid, in my opinion, some people will disagree, he is the greatest uh, human chess player that has, has ever lived. Here's the uh, machine model. Uh, on the right, it, it really looks like a, a refrigerator. 
Um, this is IBM's Deep Blue. These are the six people, the six primary people who worked on, on the uh, software. To the ex uh, extreme right is Murray Campbell, who was a graduate student at my university. A uh, third from the right is Feng Su, who was the engineering genius behind uh, Deep Blue. And here's our scorecard. Uh, Kasparov and Deep Blue were roughly the same height, but Gary Kasparov watched his weight. He was very fastidious about exercising, played a lot of tennis, and, and kept the pounds off. Deep Blue, on the other hand, was allergic to exercise. It would just sit in the corner and eat electricity all day and ballooned up to over 1,000 kilograms in weight. Whereas Kasparov was 34 years old, uh, Deep Blue, at the time of the 1997 match, was only six months old. The hardware had been put together, the body, if you will, had been put together only a few months before the match. In terms of the mental age, Gary Kasparov was 34 years old. Deep Blue, its mental ability was really its software, and that had been evolving for about 11 years. Kasparov, with his brain computer, had 50 billion neurons that he was using to battle Deep Blue with, and uh, Deep Blue had 512 chess chips. We've heard about GPUs today, special purpose computers. What they did for Deep Blue is build special purpose chips that only could play chess, and these, of course, were much, much faster than general purpose computers. Whereas Gary Kasparov, with his 50 billion neurons, could only process, on average, about two chess positions per second, uh, Deep Blue was doing 200 million. It physically had the capable capability of doing a billion positions a second, but uh, in order uh, to get the machine working on time. Their parallel algorithms were not quite as good as they could have been, so there was a lot of uh, computing potential left on the table there. Where Kasparov had a big advantage is he understood the game extremely well, and, and he, he had an incredible amount of knowledge about the game. Um, Deep Blue, on the other hand, its knowledge was very simple and rudimentary. The verdict in 1997 is that Deep Blue narrowly won the match. It was a dissatisfying result because after the match, IBM dismantled Deep Blue and ended the project. And the reason it was dissatisfying as a scientist, um, we're all about reproducibility and scientific results. So we had a data point in 1997 that suggested computers might be better than humans, but we couldn't repeat that data point because Deep Blue was gone. And so there was a lot of doubt, including myself, as to who was really better in 1997. But over time, the gap grew, and today it's quite clear, if you know anything about chess ratings, the, the top player, the world champion, has a rating of about 2,850 ELO points, and the machines are well up over 3,000, and uh, there's no question today that uh, machine computers are much better than man. And so, uh, whereas when I told you about the possibilities for checkers, I had one line of zeros, um, Chess is more complicated than checkers, and there's two lines of zeros. That's a massively big number. And the secret to Deep Blue was massive computing. 200 million chess positions per second compared to, Deep, uh, to, to Kasparov's two. And so we're exploiting the fact that computers can do amazing computations per second. Now, from human standards, 99.9999% of what the machine looked at was silly and a waste of time, but it didn't matter. The computer just used a brute force approach and searched everything uh, phenomenally deep, and the humans just couldn't compete. And so the last board game I want to talk about, which brings us up to today, 2016, is the Oriental game of Go. Here is the human computer, Lee Sedol, uh, certainly one of the greatest Go players of all time. Uh, here's who he was playing, uh, um, uh, Google's DeepMind. On, in the lower picture, you can see part of the server farm uh, for, for DeepMind. And on stage, you can see the, uh, the programming team. I, I would like to point out that David Silver, uh, who's in the center at the, in the back, uh, did his PhD at my university, and Adja Wang, who was his co-author on, on leading this project, uh, also did a postdoc at, at my university. And here's the, the lineup, very different. Lee Sedol was 33 years old compared to DeepMind, whose software was about two years old. Lee had won, was ranked 9 Dan Professional, which is the highest you can be. 
Um, Deep Mind had only played five games previously to this match, so it had no ranking. It was like a junior player with no stature whatsoever. Lee had won 18 world titles, and Deep Mind had won nothing. It hadn't competed. Lee Sedol used one brain, a human brain. We've already seen it has lots of computing power. And what DeepMind did is used 1,200 uh, general purpose CPUs and 176 GPUs for its computing. Lee, uh, over his 33 years, studied thousands of games. He played thousands of games against top-ranked humans. DeepMind looked at those games, and great, they were useful, but then it DeepMind just spent the rest of its career, its life, and in fact it's still doing it right now, is just playing against itself, game after game after game. Millions, tens of millions of games against itself, learning. Every game it learns a little bit and gets a little bit stronger. And the DeepMind of today is better than the DeepMind of two months ago, which played least at all. Um, the knowledge that Lee Sedol has is all heuristic. Go is a very complex game, and so Lee has difficulty expressing why he played certain moves. Certain moves feel better than others. And if you look at the knowledge in DeepMind, it's literally thousands, millions of numbers. And if you look at it, it's impossible to decipher. You just don't understand what the program is doing. All that matters is the moves, and the moves are amazing. And so what's the verdict? Um, that's a huge number. That's why Go has been considered the, the impossible game to, uh, to build uh, strong programs at because the search space is so enormous. The victory was stunning. Nobody, including myself, saw it coming. Uh, the knowledge that you need to play strong Go, we believed, was very hard, and people who, who had tried programming had enormous difficulty uh, doing it well. But the amazing thing about DeepMind is that it's a general purpose solution. If you took DeepMind and you pulled out the Go-specific material, it's a very small part of the program, which means you could plug in other domains, like other games, and the system would operate the same way and be able to play uh, virtually any, in this particular case, uh, two-person board game uh, at a very strong level, given enough time to actually learn how to play the game. And that's fair. Humans need time to learn how to play a game well as well. I'm not going to talk about this slide. Uh, uh, one of the secrets was the deep learning, and people have already pointed that out. It's a very powerful technique. Um, just to put the three games in perspective, you can see the timelines for them. Um, and on the right, you can see the levels. Uh, checkers, we got to world championship status uh, uh, way back in the 1990s. Chess, we didn't do it until the 2000s. And Go, we're not sure exactly where we are right now because we need more games by DeepMind, and uh, apparently there will be more matches between DeepMind and top Go players sometime in the near future. But if I want to do a comparison on the technologies, in 1994, the secret was data and computing, and learning was a small part of the program. With chess, it was basically a huge investment in computing, a little bit more in learning, and data played a very small role. And what's rev revolutionary about the work in Go is its machine learning, which runs the core, uh, the data, which it used to learn, which it generated itself uh, to a large part, was critical, and the computing is almost a secondary. The program plays very well with a, a limited amount of computing. And so conclusions, uh, games have been an excellent test bed for artificial intelligence research, and there are still other games out there that uh, um, people are working on. And Artificial intelligence technology that has been po pioneered in games has been applied to many real-world applications. And so um, I would rather do my research with games because I have an awful lot of fun doing them. Well, people in this room <coughs> talked a lot of, about important real-world applications, but um, there's something addictive about playing games because they're just intoxicating and fun and they're social. And so that's why I have the world's greatest job. Thank you very much.